And so the challenge now is, uh, in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict, how do you set a goal? How do you set a goal that's broadly resonant with the public? Because if the public doesn't agree with the goal, there's no possibility that you're going to be able to build a mass movement. And so the question then becomes, what is the standard that will work with a broad public? Now, for better or for, 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 better or for worse, and there are arguments on both sides, uh, in the world in which we currently live, in current American society, but also more broadly, you could say the limits that you can take a public the furthest they'll go before you lose them, the furthest you can take a public is the standard of international law and human rights. That's the language of what you might call, if I can use an expression which sounds a little highfalutin, but it's not intended to be, uh, you call it the, the political horizon of enlightened opinion uh, in American society. The furthest you can take people and they will accept the legitimacy uh, of the goal that you're proposing. What are you proposing? Well, we're proposing international law. What are you proposing? We're proposing what human rights organizations propose. Uh, if, you lose, if you use that kind of language, those kinds of conceptions, those reference points, I think, uh, and you have to use your own judgment, uh, you can use, you can lead the public there uh, and you can uh, reach, I think, most of the public using that standard. Uh, in particular, you can, by the way, reach the Jewish public, which for many reasons uh, finds it very difficult to uh, reject international law and human rights um, law as a legitimate standard, uh, not least because those are typical liberal values, uh, international law and uh, human rights. And in the case of the Israel-Palestine conflict, it happens that on the, using these standards, international law and human rights law, using these standards, uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict is probably without fear of, uh, without being, uh, fear of being accused of hyperbole or exaggeration, it's probably the least complicated conflict in the world today. Uh, there is no ambiguity, there is no um, gray areas in international law and human rights on how to resolve, or the terms for resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. So if I were to ask somebody in this room, let's look at the representative venues of international public opinion and see whether or not the claim I've just made that one, the terms for resolving the conflict are unambiguous, uh, lacking, in fact, any controversy. Um, oh, let's, uh, let's test that proposition. So if I were to ask one of you to name, what would you, anyone want to just give the name of the most um, representative political body in the world today? Anyone want to give the name? Yes, the United Nations General Assembly, I think that's a fair answer. The most representative political body in the world today. And every year the United Nations General Assembly passes a resolution entitled Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question. And every year uh, the terms are the same, they never change. It's two states in the June 1967 border and what's called a just resolution of the refugee question. Those are the terms for resolving the pop, uh, conflict. Uh, two states in the June 67 border and a just resolution of the refugee question. And every year the vote is roughly the same. So without going through the whole record, because it would take some time, I'll just sample it. In 1997, the vote was 155 to 2. The whole world on one side, the United States and Israel on the other side. 2010, the vote 165 to 7, uh, the whole world on one side, Israel, the US, Australia, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau on the other side. Uh, this past year, 2012, the vote 163 to 6, the whole world on one side, Israel, the US, Canada, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau on the other side. Uh, those of you who haven't heard of places like Palau 
uh, Micronesia or, or Nauru. Uh, these are American protectorates that they own. The U.S. owns them, which perhaps accounts for why they vote with the U.S. on this particular issue. They are the U.S. Um, combined, uh, combined populations could probably fit comfortably on the stage. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, because of global warming, it seems as if Israel is going to lose a couple of those allies <laughs> in the next couple of years. Uh, bear in mind that it's you that's laughing at that and not me. That's a reflection on your heartlessness, not my own. Uh, if you turn to the regional organizations, uh, in 2002, the Arab League uh, passed what's, called the, what's come to be called the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, two states, June 67 border, a just resolution of the refugee question, the same terms as the United Nations. Um, and uh, the vote in the Arab League was very close. It was what you might call a squeaker. It was 22 to 0. Uh, every year it's renewed. The Arab League Peace Initiative was actually just renewed this past April in Doha. Uh, some of you might be thinking, though probably not here, uh, but some of you might be thinking, uh, well, what about those Muslim states? Uh, and yes, uh, the Muslim states have their own organization. It's called the Organization of the Islamic Conference. Uh, and in 2002, it voted to support the Arab Peace Initiative. Again, the vote was a real squeaker. There are 57 members of the OIC, and the vote was 57 to 0. Incidentally, including the Islamic Republic of Iran, it's consistently voted with the majority for those who care about the actual real world, not as it's distilled in the American media. But since 2004, the Islamic Republic of Iran has consistently voted with the majority in the United Nations General Assembly. So when I say 165 to 5, 163 to 6, and so forth, uh, those 160 this and 160 those all include uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, so that's the record in the representative political bodies in the world, both the major global, uh, global organization, the UN, but also the regional bodies, the OIC, the Arab uh, League. Uh, but some people think, well, you know, the United Nations, they're all anti-Semitic, they're all Holocaust uh, deniers apart from Nauru, Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, where somehow they have this strange immunity uh, to these diseases and perversions. Uh, so let's try to be more fair to the Israeli side. Who would like to name the most respected legal body in the world? Legal body. The most the World Court, yes, the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Uh, and the International Court of Justice in 2004, it rendered what's called an advisory opinion on the Israel-Palestine conflict, bearing on one particular question, namely the wall that Israel has been building in the West Bank. The General Assembly asked the ICJ to render a legal, uh, legal uh, opinion on, uh, the, on the consequences of the wall that Israel is building in the West Bank. Now, what happened that in order for the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, to render this legal opinion, it had to address the fundamental issues of the Israel-Palestine conflict, what are sometimes called the permanent status issues, for the following reason. First of all, if the, if the West Bank, they had to determine where does Israel end and the Palestinian territories begin? Because if the West Bank were part of Israel, or a legitimate part of Israel, then obviously anyone has a right to build a wall on its property, and Israel would have the right to build a wall on the West Bank. So the court had to determine, to whom does the West Bank belong? Otherwise, they couldn't determine whether the wall was legal or illegal. Number two, the wall cuts right through, the east, right through east Jerusalem, because Israel wants to put the Jews on the good side and the Arabs on the bad side. Uh, so, since it's cutting through, right through East Jerusalem, the International Court of Justice has determined to whom does East Jerusalem belong. Because if it belongs to Israel, obviously anyone has a right to build a wall on their property, 
But if it doesn't belong to Israel, then obviously Israel doesn't have a right to build that wall, and it's illegal. Thirdly, the wall takes what the International Court of Justice called a sinuous, a winding route that takes in all the major settlement blocks that Israel has built in the occupied Palestinian territories. So the wall had to determine, excuse me, the ICJ had to determine, are the settlements legal? Because if the settlements are legal, well then of course you're allowed to build a wall on the periphery of the settlements, uh, because the settlements belong uh, legally your property. But if the settlements are illegal, then you can't build a wall on the periphery of the settlements. So, as it happens, for those of you who know the lingo of the so-called peace process, uh, there's this thing called the final status or permanent status issues, and three of the permanent status issues are borders, East Jerusalem, and settlements. By coincidence, the International Court of Justice, in order to decide on the legality of the wall, it had to address those questions. And what happens? Well, number one, the court says under international law, it's a no-brainer, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. That's a basic principle of international law, it's called a peremptory norm. And the court says, well, Israel acquired the West Bank and Gaza in the course of the June 1967 war, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war, therefore, obviously, Israel has no title to any of the West Bank or Gaza, because they were acquired in the war. And then the court goes on to say that the international community recognizes Palestinians have a right to self-determination, and the West Bank and Gaza constitute what the court calls occupied Palestinian territory. The West Bank and Gaza are the areas designated for Palestinian self-determination. So they are legally occupied Palestinian territories, the human rights organizations have since adopted that nomenclature, and so for those of you who read the publications, they refer to the West Bank and Gaza as OPT, the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Number two, the court said, well, Israel, how did Israel acquire East Jerusalem? It acquired East Jerusalem in the course of that same June 1967 war. It's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. Ergo, Israel has no right to East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. The court was very careful to leave no ambiguity on that point. So if you read the court opinion, it refers to the West Bank, comma, including East Jerusalem, comma, and the Gaza Strip as occupied Palestinian territory. And then the third issue, the question of the settlements, the court said it's a no-brainer under international laws, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. It's inadmissible for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupied territory. Uh, Israel is an occupied power, and therefore it's illegal for it to transfer its population to occupied Palestinian territory. And therefore all the settlements, all the settlers, uh, are illegal under international law. That's only half the story, though. Because the other half of the story, the more interesting half, if you, in my own opinion, is if you read International Court of Justice, op Justice Opinions and Decisions, uh, which I have, the 15 judges in the court are very independent, very contentious, uh, and fiercely protective of their independence. And so the decisions in the court generally, and opinions, uh, are generally very close. Uh, not in this case. On the three points I mentioned, on the question of borders, East Jerusalem, and settlements, there are 15 judges on the court. Not one judge, now mark that, <laughs> not one judge dissented from the fact, of, dissented from the majority opinion. Israel has no title to the West Bank and Gaza, those are occupied Palestinian territories, East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory, the settlements are illegal under international law. There was no dissent. Now it is true, when it came to the question of the legality of the wall itself,
there was one dissent, namely the American judge, Thomas Bergenfeld. But even Bergenfeld was very clear in his dissent, and it wasn't actually a dissent, but it's a technical issue not worth going into now. Um, even Bergenfeld, uh, in his statement, he said, there's much in the majority opinion with which I agree, and then he honed in on the question of the settlements, and he said, uh, on the question of settlements, there can't be any question under international law uh, that the settlements are um, illegal, under, uh, uh, illegal under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And so, just as in the United Nations General Assembly, just as in the Arab League, just as in the Organization of the Islamic Conference, and so now even the most respected legal body in the world, on the critical questions bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict, there's no dissent whatsoever. Literally, there is no dissent whatsoever. So that leaves us with the permanent status issues, which are allegedly so controversial that they have to be put off to the last stage of negotiations. That leaves us with only one. We have the opinion on the settlements, on the uh, East Jerusalem, on the uh, borders. What's the one we haven't heard from yet? <laughs> yes, the, que the question of the refugees. The water has since gotten lost in the issue of borders. So the water is no longer, it should be, but it's not a prominent, it's not a salient issue any longer, uh, but the question of the refugees. Now the court, the International Court of Justice was rendering an opinion on the legality of the wall and the refugees didn't come up, but it has come up among the human rights organizations in the world. So that is, if I were to ask you to just shout out what are the two main human rights organizations in the world, they are? Yes, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Uh, I don't think there's much controversy in that particular question. And as it happens, Interna uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, uh, they've both issued position papers in the question of the right of return. And Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, they've both stated that under international law, there can't be any question uh, that the Palestinian refugees and those, the technical language they use, and succeeding generations which have maintained genuine links with the land uh, have the right to return uh, to um, uh, their homes. Uh, so on the, even on the question of the right of return, uh, the major human rights organizations, and incidentally not without uh, extreme internal struggle over the issue, Human Rights Watch almost was split asunder on the question of the right of return. But finally, to their credit, they came out on the right side, which you might say the left side. Uh, they came out on the right side, and they came out in support of the, on the international law of the right of return. So, where does that leave us? Where that leaves us is the following. Number one, the terms for resolving the conflict, which in, uh, I think can reach a broad public because it's using the standards which most of the public accepts as being legitimate and reasonable, namely the standards of international law and human rights. The terms for resolving the conflict are two states in the June 1967 border and a just resolution of the refugee question. Number two, uh, the, uh, the terms for resolving the conflict are wholly and completely uncontroversial. There's no controversy whatsoever in the international community on the terms, on the, on the uh, precise terms for resolving the conflict. Israel claims that the West Bank, and Americans too, claim the West Bank is disputed territory. No, there's no dispute whatsoever. There's a consensus in the international legal community that the West Bank is not disputed territory, it's occupied Palestinian territory, full stop. Israel claims that East Jerusalem is part of what it calls its eternal and undivided capital. Well, it might think it's part of its inter eternal and undivided capital, and maybe its Bible tells it so, but that's not what the international uh, the, the representative uh, political and legal bodies in the world say. The opinion of the United Nations General Assembly and the International Court of Justice uh, is that East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory full stop. Uh, and the question of the territory of the settlements in American media, you can't say the word settlements without saying the word controversial, the controversial settlements. Uh, 
Now, there's nothing controversial about the settlements whatsoever. There is zero controversy about the settlements. All 15 judges, including the two Jewish judges on the court, Rosalind Higgins, she's married to an Irishman, and Thomas Bergenthal, who happens to be a Holocaust survivor, uh, including the two judge, uh, Jewish judges on the court, all 15 judges agree the settlements are illegal under international law. So, point number one, the terms for the resolving the conflict are clear. Point number two, there's no controversy about those terms whatsoever. And point number three, on all of these issues, the questions of uh, settlements, borders, Jerusalem, refugees, and all the final status issues, um, Israel's official position has been repudiated by the international community, which is to say, legally, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. And the Israelis are perfectly aware of this, and nobody's fooled, far, very far from it. Uh, they recognize that international law is their weak read, uh, that it's a complete disaster for them, actually. Uh, and so, for example, in 2008-9, when the negotiations were going on between the Israelis and Palestinians, we have an extensive record of those negotiations because they were leaked to Al Jazeera. It's a very long record. It runs to some 15,000 pages. Uh, regrettably, people talk about it, but I don't think they have sat down to read the record. It's actually very informative, uh, quite revealing. Uh, but on this particular point, which I'm talking about now, uh, the Foreign Minister Tsipi Livni, she was very forthright. She said, now I'm quoting her, she said, talking to the Palestinian delegation, she said, I am a lawyer, but I am against law, international law in particular. Uh, that was not being hypocritical, that was actually being very consistent. Because Tsipi Livni is the Foreign Minister of the State of Israel which means she has to represent Israel's official positions uh, on the international stage. And she fully well knows that those official positions of Israel uh, are completely inconsistent, actually in flagrant contradiction, to international law. So as the foreign minister of the state of Israel, she has to be against international law. She doesn't really have an alternative option. So, that's where I think matters stand. I would just want to emphasize one point before we turn to questions, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Um, the most important thing, I think, to, in my opinion, to walk away with, apart from the record itself, is how you formulate a goal. A goal has nothing to do uh, with personal opinions. It's not what I feel. As in, whenever you have conversations about the Israel-Palestine conflict, within 30 seconds, you have the question pops up, are you for one state or two states? It's completely irrelevant what you're for or what I'm for. If you ask me personally, I'm not for two states, I'm not for one state. I'm for no states. That's my values. <laughs> Those are my values. But I recognize it has nothing whatever to do with the terms for resolving the conflict. Mr. Gandhi himself, he lived two lives. One life everybody knows, he was the leader of, a leader of the Indian independence movement. But he had a second life. Gandhi was a cult leader. He was the leader of an ashram in India, or several ashrams. And when he was in that cult, when he was the leader of that cult, he was very strict. You're not having, you're not eating meat in this ashram, we're vegetarians. There will be no sex in this ashram because we're all brahmacharis. There will be no underwear in this ashram because that's a Western dalliance. There will be no uh, wristwatches in this ashram. There will be no joking while doing your duties in this ashram. He was a very tough taskmaster. He had even a kind of Orwellian quality to him, because at one point it was suggested that every member of the ashram has to keep a diary of what they're doing every second of every day, because otherwise you're squandering time, and for the Mahatma, squandering time was the ultimate of sins. But Gandhi well enough knew that you don't confuse a cult 
with a political movement. If he had made being, if he had made vegetarianism, brahmacharya, and all the rest conditions for being a member of the Indian independence movement, the Congress party, well, the whole Congress party would probably not even fill the seats in this room. There's a very different standard for your personal beliefs and for building a political movement. And the only relevant standard for building a political movement is how far you can take the public without then losing it. And that's the standard I think we have to focus on and not on our personal uh, beliefs or our personal ideology. Okay, thank you. Global Voices for Justice is a nonprofit media organization. Our mission is to bring to you independent thinkers and analysts who enhance our understanding of the world we live in. Your financial support enables us to achieve our mission. With a minimum $12 contribution, you will receive a copy of this talk. Thank you.